A mathematical set is a collection of unique items. No two items in a set can be the same. You might think such a theoretical concept has no place in programming languages, but I have found them quite useful, especially operations we perform on sets. Okay? So in Python, a set is unordered and can only contain hashable objects. So if it can be the key of a dictionary, it can be an item in a set, otherwise it's not allowed. Okay? The set object itself is mutable, but you also have a frozen set that is immutable. The way Python stores sets is they basically use a dictionary structure except they don't store values, so they're just storing the keys. So you get the same O1 behavior for adding, removing, and finding items in a set. In Python, when we want to define a set, we can use curly braces. However, we can't use an empty curly brace. We need at least one element. And we can have multiple elements separated by commas. If we add the same item twice to a set, it's as if we only added it once. Note that in set syntax, we do not have colons. That's only in dictionaries. The colon separates the key from the value in dictionaries. You can also do a set comprehension. Set comprehension behaves just like a list comprehension, except it creates a set from the result. Note that in a dictionary comprehension, the expression is actually a key value pair, but in a set comprehension, it's a simple value. Now that you have the set comprehension, we now have all of the comprehensions you can have in Python 3.7. So you can have a function call comprehension. You can have a generator expression. This is a comprehension. You can have a list comprehension. You can have a dictionary comprehension. So this is key value for. And then finally, we can have a set comprehension. Give yourselves a pat on the back. You've now mastered at least one aspect of Python's programming language. Sets have quite a few operators in Python. Let's start with the simple x in s and x not in s. So the x in s tests whether the value x is found in the set, and x not in s will test whether x is not in the set. This will return turn true if it is found, and this will return false if it's not found. We also have a is equal to b, which is true if all the elements in a are found in b, and all the elements of b are found in a. So this is the same as a is less than or equal to b, and let's root, and a is greater than or equal to b, which at first this doesn't make a lot of sense, but it'll make sense when you study sets theoretically at a mathematical level. We also have a is not equal to b, and this is true if there are elements in a that are not in b, or vice versa. Okay, and you have of course comparators in sets. So you have this is the strictly subset where all the elements are found in b, but not but b has additional elements. Then we have a is not equal to b, which a is less than or equal to b, which means that a has a elements are all found in b, and b may have the same elements as b, a, but may have more as well. Okay, and then you have a is greater than or equal to b, which says all the elements of b are found in a, and then a is greater than b means that all the elements of b are found in a, and a has additional elements. Okay, there are some bitwise operators as well. So we have a pipe b. So this would be a or b if we we're doing bitwise binary operations. But what this one says is this one creates a new set with elements from both a and b. Okay, so the set could be larger uh, than a or b if a or b isn't equal to each other, right? And b isn't a subset of a or whatnot. Then we have the ampersand. So this is, uh, we're gonna call this one union. This one is called intersection. So this one says only in A and B. So if an element is both in A and in B, then it's returned. This one returns an element that, that you'll find in A and all the elements you'll find in B, okay? Then we have A minus B. This is called difference. What this does is it takes all the elements of A and removes the elements found in B. And so you only get the elements that are special to A. 
Okay, and then we have a caret b. Okay, this might be exclusive or in the binary environment. Um, this is the symmetric difference. In the other, in other words, this is all the elements in a that are not found in b, and all the elements of b that are not found in a. So a way to think of this is this is a minus b uh, union with b minus a. Okay. Uh, typically, I don't use the operators. There's, there's method names that do the same thing and are more explicit, but um, you'll see people use them from time to time, so you should be prepared to, to understand what they mean. There are a number of functions, not that many, that deal with sets. So we have set that would return a new empty set. We also have frozen set that does the same but with the frozen set. And we can also pass in some iterable to set and this will create a new set from those items and the same thing for frozen set. Okay. Then we have len of a set will tell you the number of items and the other operators that deal with iterables will also work with sets. Okay. The order of the items in the set may not be what you expect, but it will give them all eventually. There are quite a few methods that you can have on a set. The first one I'll tell you about is copy. This will create a copy of the set or frozen set. Okay. Then we have a bunch of tests. We have is disjoint. And what this returns is true if there are no common. Okay, so everything in A is not found in B, and everything in B is not found in A. Then we also have A is subset. And this will basically be true if A is less than or equal to B. So all the values of A are found in B. But it could also be true if A and B are the same sets. And then we also have A dot is superset. And this will be true if uh, A is greater than or equal to B. Okay, same thing except B is the elements. B's elements must all be in A. Okay, we can combine sets to create new sets using these methods. So we have A dot union and we're going to have star others. So you can specify one or more other sets to be union of. And this will return a set or frozen set with all the elements in A and the others. Okay. Then we have intersection, A dot intersection. And again, we can have a list of others specified as parameters to this fun this method. And this will return the set with only the elements in all of A and the others. Okay, so only the elements that are found in each of these sets. Then we have difference. Again, you can specify a list of others. And this will return a set of elements from A not found in the others. And then we have symmetric difference. And you can specify only one other set. And this will be the set of all elements. and B, but not A, and A, not B. So the elements that are unique to A and unique to B, okay? These methods, they work for frozen sets or for regular sets, okay? There are certain methods that only work for sets. The first method is add. Add will add a new item to the set, assuming it's unique. If it's already in there, it does nothing. OK. 
Okay, then we can remove. What this will do is it will remove the value from the set. If it's not there, then it will raise a key error. There's also discard, which does the same as remove. However, if it's missing, it will do nothing. Okay. There is also pop, which will return a value from the set. If the set is empty, it will raise a key error. And then we also have a.clear, which will remove all the items from the set. It may not be immediately obvious why sets are useful or when you would ever use these. However, many algorithms, uh, especially if you go through computer science, many algorithms actually have some of the set operations as part of the algorithm. Here are a few cases where you might see the set algorithms appear, right? So we want a unique list. I'm sorry, this is supposed to be a Q, unique list. So we're given a list of items and we want to find the unique ones. Well, obviously that's just creating a set. So you have to go through and add each of the items to a set. And if you come across a duplicate item, it isn't added because it's already there, okay? So that's pretty typical. Um, you want to know of stuff that's here, but not there. Like you're doing some kind of update operation and you only want to update the stuff that's actually missing. And so that is basically a set difference operation, right? So you want set stuff that's in the first set, but not in the second set, okay? You want to check that everything is here. So you have a list of stuff over here and you have a list of stuff over there and you want to check that everything is present from this list and that list, or you want to find what's missing or what's been added. That's pretty typical to do in computer programming. As you program, you'll recognize the situations that arise where sets are ideal, especially now that you know what sets are and what the operations look like. People who are experienced in programming should at least be familiar with the algorithms necessary to do the set operations. They might not know that these are actually set operations because they might not be formally trained in mathematics, uh, but they certainly have run into these situations where they arise and they have figured out some sort of good solution. It's not very difficult to come up with a good solution for this. When I interview programmers for positions at a company that I'm working for, I often ask the more senior ones to do some set operations. I won't call them set operations, but I will have them do algorithms that they should have run into that are actually set algorithms. Okay. And if they are very familiar with this, they'll be able to quickly rattle out some kind of solution. But if it's new to them, or if they're not familiar with it, then that means they're not very senior in their programming experience. Younger programmers don't have much experience around this. Uh, they probably haven't run into the situations where set operations are ideal. And so when they answer these questions, they fumble around, they have problems with it. But senior programmers will quickly recognize the solutions and they'll quickly write it on the board. So it's a good, kind of a test question to see if you are very familiar with programming. So if you want to pass yourself off as a senior programmer in my eyes, then I would expect you to know the set operations and be able to rattle off how they work from memory. And you should also be able to identify quickly when you see situations arise where the set operations are actually useful. And better yet, if you know what their names are, then that's bonus points as well. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you find opportunities to use sets in your programming experience. Hope especially that you understand now that there's this pattern to these objects. I don't think there's any more objects we're gonna cover in Python, so this is the last one. From here on out, we're gonna move more towards examining some other aspects of the programming language, and then we're gonna move into object-oriented programming. So give yourself a pat on the back. You've really reached some kind of milestone in your Python understanding. And so hopefully from here on out, things are gonna get really exciting. Guys, have a great day, take care, and bye-bye. Thank you for watching this video on the theory of Python by Real Physics. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell, like and share this video. You can find me on Discord or support me on Patreon. Links are in the description below. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.